Um, so, so welcome everyone uh, to this this panel. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, good good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Um, so, I thought I'd start with a current current story. Um, if you all have been following the news over the past week, uh, and and that is the the prison siege in uh, Hazaka, uh, and you know, in that you had 700 boys uh, in a prison. You had uh, ISIS fighters uh, create two large explosions outside that prison. Uh, you had scores that entered. Uh, and as uh, the SDF came, uh, you had sleeper cells sniping from grain silos. Thousands and thousands of local residents had to flee the area while a six-day siege took place. The trauma, the anxiety, the stress, the fear that comes along with that experience is immense and life-changing. But if you zoom out, these sorts of instances have been happening for, you know, depending for five years, 10 years, decades. Uh, and not just in this area, you know, you have Raqqa, you have Deir Zor, uh, you have uh, across the border in Iraq, Ninawa, uh, Erbil, many others, where you have entire populations who have only known stress who have only known violence uh, for for too long, the the psychosocial effects uh, on that uh, on those individuals are profound. Uh, there's exhaustion across Iraq and Syria due to the constant effort to try and rebuild their lives, and truthfully, there's a pervasive pessimism, pessimism uh, that change is is actually possible, um, and you can see that. I mean, the name of this this panel is uh, you know post ISIS. Uh, when we're still having six-day uh, standoffs with ISIS in the same areas that we're calling post. Uh, this chronic and overwhelming stress is something that we, we really need to deal with as practitioners. We need to facilitate that process of trauma integration and enable these individuals to build the inner resources to manage and thrive. We need to help them reshape social dynamics and norms. Uh, otherwise, we'll never be able to be partners in interrupting those cycles of violence. We need to build social resilience and shift from survival towards longer term growth. Um, it's critical that development programming directly address the underlying trauma, uh, which prevents individuals and communities from building the inner resources, not just the external infrastructure necessary to undertake this process. Uh, if we don't do that, stabilization programming will have uh, limited impact and sustainability. Um, so in this particular uh, panel over the next 90 minutes, we're really going to be examining the symbiosis of integrated trauma-informed approaches and the role that trauma and social and gender norms and the importance of using trauma-informed approaches in stabilization and reconciliation programming, uh, particularly in post-ISIS contexts. Uh, we're going to be focusing on the lessons learned and the best practices from trauma-informed programming in Iraq and Syria, uh, but of course, you know, these lessons can be applied to post-conflict programming in, in many places, you know, to name a few, Yemen or Nigeria or other Islamic State contexts, but also just context where the population has been traumatized. Um, in order to explore this uh, really delicate, difficult topic, we uh, have four incredible practitioners uh, from diverse backgrounds. Uh, they're going to give their perspectives uh, and, and talk us through. Um, if anybody has questions uh, throughout the process, please just put them in the uh, in the chat, um, and we'll try and get to them. Uh, rather than have a Q and A at the end, this is going to be a conversation not only between you know these four four amazing individuals, but also everyone who's logged on. Uh, first, we have Humam Rajab, uh, who is the director of Stabilization, Transition, and Peace Building at DT Institute. I have the honor of working with him every day. Uh, and he brings over 15 years of programming management experience uh, in stabilization programming and m in Iraq. Uh, he's originally from Baghdad, so of course he knows the local context uh, extremely well. Uh, and he has a well-established network of CSOs uh, that he's previously worked with across Iraq. Uh, second, we have Michelle Girard, who has over 20 years of experience designing and managing stabilization, CVE, and conflict mitigation work in Central Asia, uh, Southern Africa, Afghanistan, and the MENA region. Uh, she is the founder of Third Eye Par Paradigm, um, which promotes the integration of trauma-informed and relational approaches 
as critical components to sustainable social transformation. Uh, as part of this portfolio, she has designed and directed two trauma-informed stabilization projects in Mosul, uh, Iraq, uh, and that to increase the, the social safety uh, and contributes to the technical expertise to DTI's PRMV Iraq project uh, that uh, both Humam and Gaith are involved in. Uh, third, we have Robbie Harris, and she also has 20 years of experience uh, working with local influencers, activists, CSOs, and stakeholders in the MENA region to design and implement strategies to drive social movements that su support sustainable change. Uh, she really focuses on the intersectionality uh, of traditional and digital communications and non-virtual human engagement uh, to catalyze personal agency uh, among youth, mitigate polarization and marginalization that leads to conflict and violence, and, and promote women's involvement in the decision making, which is particularly important in these contexts. Uh, she had designed and directed projects in MENA and the Sahel for government and non-government entities. Uh, last but not least, we have Dr. Gaith Hamid, uh, who's the technical manager uh, for preventing reprisals and mitigating violence in Iraq project. Uh, he is an internal medicine and trauma specialist with over a decade of experiencing managing trauma-informed programs in Iraq. Uh, he leveraged his background in medicine to develop science-backed trauma-sensitive approaches and has trained participants, beneficiaries, and civil society organizations across Iraq on those approaches. So you'll see we have a really impressive panel here. Um, and so they're the stars. I'm just going to try and, and keep us on track and make sure that, that uh, those of you who are watching are also part of the conversation. But I kick it off first um, over to you, Humam. Um, in your experience integrating trauma-informed approaches uh, to your programming and strategic communications, um, why was it so important? Why did you stress this approach in the context of your work in, in both Iraq and Syria? Thank you, Cameron, and I really appreciate the opportunity with, um, with the Alliance for Peace Building at the PeaceCon Conference 10. Uh, a couple, uh, let me take you a little bit back uh, in, uh, into 2017. <clears throat> Sorry, when we first started the um, uh, our approach and our intervention uh, in the newly liberated areas in uh, in Iraq, uh, we were privileged to work with a donor that um, um, continued to fund us for uh, for almost four years now. Uh, actually, we are into the fifth, and we were able to implement uh, uh, conflict resolution and uh, conflict mitigation programming across all these four years. The reason we and why why trauma was important. We started the first uh, two year with this program, uh, focusing on um, the uh, the traditional conflict mitigation and uh, the traditional uh, uh, conflict styles that we thought if we were able to construct together into uh, uh, some of the reputable people in the in the neighborhood, this would be enough uh, to resolve. Uh, to address first and resolve claims at the local level in, uh, in the liberated areas. However, uh, as we intervened in the first two years, we uh, faced uh, many scenarios that we did not have a full uh, answers to. Uh, for instance, uh, we helped in the very beginning of the return of some of the ISIS-related families, specifically the innocent ones, the ones who get caught in the middle of the um, uh, of the fight without having any, uh, without having any, uh, uh, without being uh, by any means being part of it, and they just uh, and specifically they were the elderly, uh, the women and the children. We found different scenarios, and uh, for instance, in South Mosul, and uh, in an area uh, specifically, uh, we were able uh, the return of an elderly woman with her uh, grandsons and the women in the family was so easy. While 10 miles uh, from, this from this location, it was almost impossible to, retain, to return a woman with the same exact specification to this location. And honestly, we did not find any answers. We thought in the beginning, we, if we increase the competition uh, uh, among the community outlets that we've created across the different locations in the liberated areas, we would uh, maybe get successful showing positive positive devious examples uh, from across the neighborhood uh, rather than examples uh, that uh, the usual conflict programming uh, use from uh, uh, you know from rwanda or from south africa we, we tried to make it a hyper local approach 
However, we did not get uh, uh, we did not get answers. Uh, so um, uh, during that, we uh, our programming also uh, included Stratcom, and we thought. Uh, that um, the strategic communication uh, will help build and lay uh, the ground for our community outlets to be able to communicate uh, uh, or to um, the messages that they bring to the community are not new. And they've been examined through mainly social media because social media was really uh, viral in Iraq. And uh, um, w at that time, we used the expertise of, of Robbie and Michelle to help us shape the Stratscom. And we found that they've delegated part of their work uh, into uh, uh, trauma awareness. And then uh, we, we start discussing how we can integrate trauma into our approach as a second, uh, as a, as a second approach, as a complemented, com complementary approach to the usual conflict management. And guess what? The results were, were unbelievable. We were able to, uh, once we start examining the trauma, Across the uh, across the different locations, we found that uh, 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 all these trainings that we provided that has a trauma lens or trauma approach, people uh, uh, from across Iraq and Syria, because we, we like you know we started first in Iraq and then this project has been uh, also uh, uh, utilized or the model was utilized in Syria in many locations. Uh, uh, the the trauma lens and the trauma informed uh, approaches allowed us. Uh, to first use trainings while we don't we don't do trauma healing by any means but the trainings themselves we found we found out that the trainees which is they, they are the the, the the sometimes many of them are the reputable uh, the 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 sheikhs some of the security forces and even lo the local government they use these trainings as veins to uh, to talk about their own uh, to, to talk about their own trauma and, uh, and, and and based on that, and after that, and we were like, you know, both me and Raith will be able also to uh, to mention this. We were receptive and uh, we tell them that you are on the victim side. You are not on the perpetrator side or the ones who caught in the middle or have a bad reputation of joining the extremist, the, the extremist groups. How do you think those people will feel uh, if you are feeling this way? And I think this was basically the trigger uh, to look at uh, the aspects of using a trauma-informed approach that started that started first from uh, creating a safe space uh, at the, the actual the at the community outlets or as we call them the crisis committee meetings where they start listening to each other. They changed dramatically their uh, meetings with the beneficiaries from interrogation sessions into a uh, more of, I would say, a collaborative chatting sessions, allowing victims to open up and to speak exactly what they are, what their fears and what the exact circumstances, helping our committees and helping our project across time to, uh, uh, to first understand the situation better, uh, decide on when to intervene and decide on what's the best way of intervention given the experience they have over the years. So to to, lumps, to uh, you know to wrap up what I'm saying is that the trauma has honestly provided us answers when we did not have a, a clear image on why these things why things specific things are happening across the different locations. Uh, second, it allow us to understand even the perpetrator's mindset. What, talking about the extremist, and if you want to, um, if you want to title these kind of prog programs as the ISIS or countering uh, violent extremism, it gives us way more leverage on understanding where they come from and put together the best tactics to co uh, in uh, in intervening and uh, and in combating them. And while we are, me and Raith both are uh, local, and we um, uh, honestly uh, d uh, always adopt a hyper, a hyper local approach. But sometimes, even personally, and I'm sure Raith will speak up on this one as well. Personally, we were dealing with the problems, whether it's on the personal level or whether it's on the professional level with our staff or with our beneficiaries, always having our uh, the trauma informed approach and the background uh, of our thinking oh why did he do this why did he where did he come from is there a better way to resolve this 
can we uh, i mean i mean sometimes even the um, uh, uh, i would say the, the the practical things that you sleep on an, a bad email and then answer the second day i think this will become more i would say uh, uh, more plausible having the trauma into uh, into the back of your head so i will allow the rest of the incredible uh, you know uh, panelists speak up but this is basically lump sum why i think it's super important Michelle, you know, uh, Humam mentioned that it was really you and, and Robbie sort of entering the scene uh, uh, that uh, empowered Humam and, and Gaith uh, to start using this trauma-informed lens. Um, could you let us know a little bit more about uh, your, your background, why this is so important from a, a real trauma practitioner's lens uh, and, and the results that you also saw from your perspective? Uh, thank you, Cameron, and also thank you to um, AFP for this a wonderful opportunity to DTI to be part of this panel and to all of the participants. Um, and huge gratitude as well to Iraqis um, who have been uh, such an important partner uh, in this in in this approach, which is very much an organic approach. It's an iterative approach, and and it. It really needs to be in order to meet people where they are in their own uh, journey of, of social change uh, and, and social repair and social recovery. Um, I, uh, as, as you mentioned in the beginning, I have been working in stabilization now for about 20 years. And I, I have an educational background in, in conflict analysis and resolution. And in the field, you know, there have been amazing uh, advancements and understanding and, and evaluation lesson learned around conflict mitigation and conflict transformation, as Humam had said. And yet, returning to the same locations over and over, seeing success when projects are being implemented and backsliding, um, when the project ends, and looking at the question of sustainability with everything that we know, why is this? Why are we still seeing similar cycles of harm and similar cycles of violence uh, in the areas where we've been working, where largely you see generations of protracted conflict? And I think for me, this journey really started 10 years ago coming out of Zimbabwe um, and the post-electoral violence that had happened in 2008 and working there for almost four years. And um, that, that experience in Zimbabwe planted the seed of exploration of understanding the deeper implications and effect of trauma on social dynamics, not only the individual, but in, in, in many of these contexts that we're working in, people are experiencing not just personal trauma or personal survival or personal chronic and overwhelming stress, but they're also experiencing on a collective level and in so many different areas of their life. So you have historical trauma, you have uh, cultural trauma, you have uh, dignity violations, structural violence, uh, systemic uh, trauma. So it, it is multifaceted, it is complex, it is individual, it is collective. And then we begin to see from the social perspective, the, the neurological perspective, the spiritual perspective, the existential perspective, um, it, in the cognitive perspective, how is this impacting the individual, their relationship with self, their relationship within their group, and their relationship between groups? And, and you know, the evidence shows, um, and I think one of the reasons why we can really start exploring these trauma-informed approaches is because, you know, really over the past 10, 15, 20 years, there has been a much deeper understanding of the impact of trauma, both individually and collectively. And we know that people who have experienced trauma or are living in survival uh, circumstances or living in traumagenic environments, 
that this type of these this type of stress is uh, is very much impacting what people believe is safe, who they believe is safe. Uh, it is impacting how they see themselves. It is impacting how they see their future, whether they even see a future. Uh, decision making starts to uh, coalesce around short term survival strategies. Uh, or we, we also see how people are perceiving others. It is, it is shaping our perceptions of, of our group and, and other groups. It is increasing a sense of threat, right? Not just a, a sense of physical threat, but then also the ideas of others, the beliefs of others start to feel threatening to us when there's been particularly collective harm done between groups. Trust is lower. The ability to see other perceptions is reduced. And so all of this is, is really feeding the, the social dynamic. And when we're coming into these projects, uh, or sorry, coming into these contexts and we are developing and designing stabilization projects or reconciliation projects or projects around social cohesion, right? These are asking people to, I mean, it's a, it's a heavy, heavy lift to come into either protracted or post-conflict situation where people have, ha have experienced real emotional harm and oftentimes physical harm. And, um, and, and, and talk about reconciliation. Talk about uh, social cohesion. Talk about change even. Do they believe change is possible? And the resources it takes for someone to be able to really sustainably create social change, which really, requires us to be able to see things differently, to be able to see a different future, to be able to believe that we can actually impact a situation, to be able to put our own pain aside and, 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 and engage. And when people are, are very much in that survival mode, Right? The, the resources that they have to, to engage in, in a very heavy emotional cognitive process are, re, are, are really reduced, right? And so as, as Humam mentioned, what we're not trying to do is, is we're not there as therapists in a healing context. And, and we will talk about the how we do this uh, as, as we go on in this discussion, but it's it is about how do we help people to increase their inner capacity and inner resources to hold and manage uh, that emotional experience and pain that they've had in order to begin to shift things, in order to increase their, their, their internal resources to be able to create the shift that they need in order to engage in social change and social transformation or social cohesion for example. Um, and so that these projects don't remain an external construct, but actually start to come from within so that people are able in the moment to make a different decision mm. without us being there or without us saying what that decision should be or what that reaction should be. Mm. Um, and, and just one other, um, point that I'll make. One thing that I've noticed over the, the 20 years that I have been, and I've worked both, I was with on the donor side with USAID uh, for 14 years with OTI, and I've also been on the implementer side. And, and over the 20 years, I've noticed that uh, our relationship with those that we are, are, are there to support and there to serve has changed dramatically as security pro protocols have changed 
is our ability to interact directly and informally with individuals so that we actually have a deeper relational uh, experience with them um, and to understand the deeper emotional experience that they've had. And what often happens is that we're particularly because of the inability to engage more directly, we are we are more reading about these things and, and experiencing it indirectly rather than having a more direct experience of it. And I think that really impacts our ability to meet people where they are in terms of understanding how to support them to be able to move through these really difficult experiences that they've had. Um, you know, we we need to acknowledge and validate the experiences that people are having. And so this this approach is very much a a human centered approach. It's a very much a humanizing approach. It addresses the whole person. It is um, it is it is much about the empathy that you're bringing as the analysis that you're bringing or the assessment that you're bringing. And I would also say that it is recognizing that the important work of systems change, the important work of building institutions is also really critical to understand that institutions and systems do not necessarily normalize a context or normalize people or heal people. They can certainly harm people, right? And we know that. But if we're not tending to the, the, the experience, the, the emotional experience, the, the painful experience, the harmful experience that people have gone through and how it's shaping their perception of others, that's what they're bringing to these systems. That's what they're, what they're bringing to these institutions and the application of policy. And so, and we know this globally, you can have amazing policies, you can have, um, you know, built uh, incredible, quote unquote, democratic institutions, but people comprise those institutions, people implement those policies. And, and so it's not just about systems and institutions and, and, and building technical capacity, it's about building emotional capacity. Thank you. Wow, thanks, Michelle. And and I would say to, to people listening, the best part of this was actually the preparation for this panel, because uh, we got to listen to Michelle and, and Robbie just talk about this for hours, uh, and it was incredible. So I also want to allow Robbie uh, to maybe add any additional color you want on this first question, and Gaith as well. Um, and as Michelle said, we're going to get to the how in a little while, but I think it's important that we, we uh, really cover the why first. Uh, Cameron, thank you. And a big thanks to AFP and um, to Humam for inviting me to participate with you all. I remember exactly where I was the day Humam came to me and said, oh, we want to do this work in Iraq. I'm like, oh, well, you have to have a trauma-informed approach. He said, oh, what? I said, oh, you have to have a trauma-informed approach. You must talk to Michelle. <laughs> and, the, and I couldn't see his face. I could imagine the look on his face. Um, and so for me, I'm almost teary-eyed hearing your story, Humam, about how you talked about it. And I just recently had the pleasure to meet Gaith and, and hear about all of how you've integrated it into your approach from a medical perspective and how you have turned it into something that is really, really Iraqi. But I'll leave that to him to tell. Um, particularly for me, I first went to Iraq in 2020, sorry, 2002. I'm a little nervous. Um, so before this, this invasion, conflict, whatever you choose to call it, whatever your lingo is. And I actually went twice. And um, I started working on a USAID project, a local governance project in 2003 in Basra. And since then, I've spent the majority of the remaining time, almost, was that 17 years, 14 years, uh, 17 years, 
So in working in Iraq on and off. And after about 10 to 12 years, I started looking around and I thought, you know, we what's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting different results. You start to see the same projects come back through USAID. Whatever they are, local governance, um, fixing the pay system in Baghdad. It goes through one year. It comes back eight years later. And you're like, there's a problem here. Why are we spending $70 billion and things aren't moving? And you can't blame it necessarily on the Iraqis or what? what's the issue? It's not money, right? So we know it's not money. So I really started to look at it and it began this um, self reflect period of self-reflection for me. And first I started looking at why am I making the decisions I'm making? What's the context? What's feeding into that? And I had a mentor in strategic communications who told me, he said, Robbie, all conflict is social conflict. And when you look at that, he said, you need to look, and he's got this really great, his name is uh, Dr. Dana Ayer, and he has a great model. And he said, there are he has a psychosocial approach to it. And it's narratives and networks, identities and interests, which are the social part of it, drives people's demands, desires, and disgusts. And so from a communications perspective, typically what you'll get from a donor or a client is you want to change demands, desires, and disgust. But they forget about all the social part over here. Now, I wouldn't have called this a trauma-formed approach until probably about a year or two years ago. But what it really means is where are people at? And I have seen all of our work that we've done as the as the because I was on the donor side as well, that we have done that assumes people are, are at where we think they are. I mean, even in the first days of Iraq, we were bringing people in from the Balkans and they assumed it was the same. They assumed it needed the same approach because maybe the demographics were similar. But demographics doesn't tell the whole story. And so for me, from a communications perspective, it's like, how do I reach people? Well, it's got to be more than how old they are, what sex they are, what gender they it's got to be more than that. And why and it, it's why are people making the decisions they're making? And to me, that's a trauma informed approach is getting into those understanding what the interests and the identities, the networks and the narratives are so that you can meet people where they are. Because too often our approaches assume that they're down here and we set our projects up to start five miles out and people haven't even left the gate. And this is particularly around Mosul. We had donors coming up. Oh, we need to talk about reconciliation. I'm like, people are hardly even willing to talk to their neighbor let alone reconcile with somebody that they don't like. You need to get to that. We need to start where people are. And if I had to break trauma and a trauma informed approach down to one thing and Michelle and everybody may disagree, but it's really looking at where people are. And the trauma part of it is understanding the mechanics of trauma, how it affects where people are, how it affects their identities, their interests, their networks, and their narratives, because it all determines who is other to them. And in the conflicts in Iraq and Syria, people have used otherness as a way to instigate and prolong the conflict. And so until we can, and a lot of conflict is this way, it's not just Iraq and Syria. So until we actually decide that we want to look at these originating issues, yes, you need to deal with the symptoms of the problem. But here we are 20 years later doing the same projects and why. But we can't understand how and why people are making decisions until we as individuals start to look at our own trauma and how that has affected us. Because I admit, as a white Western woman, I have no idea that comes from a middle class family. I have no idea what it's like to be hungry. I have no idea what it's like to worry if a shell is going to come through the roof of my house and if me and my children are going to survive. I have no idea what it's like to do my homework by candlelight on a regular basis because there is no electricity. So how can I understand and make judgments on the people I'm working with and their decision making processes unless I understand how and why I make my decisions? Then I can have the compassion to start to look at that and then work with these people, whomever they may be, to come up with effective approaches. And to me, that's a trauma informed approach. And that's why it's important. I'm done now. Thanks. And, and I mean. Picking up on that, um, I want to move to you, Gaith. Um, 
uh, as, as a practitioner who's doing this on the ground, you know, every single day, um, you know, and Humam touched on this a little bit, but maybe you can give us some more examples or, or a little bit more color on how a trauma informed lens helps you to understand your local context and, and how it shapes the social and gender norms and communication patterns in, in not only the areas that you work, but even extrapolating out how it, it, it uh, you know, um, shapes gender norms, communication patterns in protracted conflict societies. Uh, thank you very much, Tony, and uh, thanks for uh, my colleagues for this uh, uh, really uh, effective participation in this panel. Uh, I am so glad to be with you here. Um, uh, talking about my personal experience in this program, uh, as you know, I, have, uh, I am a medical doctor and uh, specialized in internal medicine with subspecialty in respiratory medicine. Um, I've been graduated in 2001. We studied in the college uh, many topics in psychology, psychiatry, and neurology. Uh, and in fact, even in my practice in, in civil society uh, organizations, we used to deliver trainings about self-care, about uh, psychosocial support. Uh, in addition to my reading in, in sociology and uh, psychology, which I like most. Uh, in fact, uh, for the first time uh, in this program, uh, I found that uh, it connects dots that uh, many questions we had before about people and why they respond in this way or the other toward all these threats in Iraq. Mm -hmm. And even the psychology of those terrorists, that how come a person uh, would go and explore himself in order to harm others and what is the benefit for him and why he is doing so and joining this really uh, terrifying and horrible uh, groups. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's why uh, when we started to, to be trained uh, about trauma-informed uh, approach, I started to understand better the, uh, the cycle of violence and the motives for people to do such acts. And uh, it gave me another uh, lens to, to look at the cases that we already received from the uh, committees and uh, uh, try to understand better the, uh, the way they are solving uh, the problems and cases. Uh, in many in many times, uh, the committees send reports that there's a, a case where people had a conflict for, for many years and it had not been resolved in spite of all the efforts of sheikhs, of social leaders or community leaders. But when they started to communicate with the two parties and they provided safe space for them, they uh, reached out to a more uh, innovative, practical, and trauma sensitive solutions. Uh, and interestingly, whenever I meet the committee members, whether in strategic meetings, which we had before a few days uh, in the three governorates, uh, or in the uh, training workshops, usually I ask them, what is the most interesting part in the program? What did you like most in the trainings? Usually, most of participants, they respond that the trauma sensitive approach, they liked it so much. Uh, and they give many examples about their practice with, the, with beneficiaries, uh, for instance, that how they create safe space for people to talk about very sensitive topics. Even women in a very conservative society, they, they began to express themselves and talk about their traumas, which is usually they feel uh, afraid or ashamed to talk about it. Uh, and interestingly, in one of, the, uh, of our uh, workshops, those people who are... Uh, well-known, respected, powerful sheikhs, uh, they talked about their personal traumas. Uh, they, they had the free space to talk and say, well, during ISIS invasion to our lands, we felt uh, very uh, afraid, anxious about ourselves, about our families, and we did not, and we feel shame that we couldn't defend ourselves or do something against these terrorist acts. From another point of view, uh, we, we found that some directors uh, of districts or sub-districts, districts, they talked about their experience uh, when they uh, meet people who are traumatized and they feel that they cannot provide adequate services for them. Uh, and this caused continuous trauma for them. Interestingly, when we, um, when we were trained about trauma, we started to look at the committee members in a different way. 
we started to understand why they respond in this way in the training workshops, why they they address this case or they uh, they don't uh, have any approach to others and why some cases are resolved very easily in some districts and it's difficult to be resolved in another. Uh, so uh, we understood well that trauma informed approach helps people to have better better understanding and to reach to uh, a more innovative um, solutions for their problems. Uh, the committee members, they have high skills and very good understanding to their local community. Uh, so they can use uh, some uh, some examples, some positive deviances to rely on, and uh, they they use the experience of the uh, older shares, or uh, they know better how to approach the traumatized people, trying to relieve them, uh, reaching to a better solution. Uh, they gave me many examples. I'm proud to, to talk about it. Uh, before a few days, uh, when we had strategic meeting in Biala, um, uh, I was surprised uh, when uh, one member uh, who used to be uh, not very engaged in the beginning of the program, that now he is very um, interactive, very uh, interested in, in his work. Uh, and I asked them uh, why you would stand all these pressures, all these uh, threats from some uh, people in your local community and try to resolve cases. They said, I believe that my personal benefit and profit comes from helping people. Mm. They said, I have started to be more proud about myself that I achieved a lot to my community. Uh, they also said that we are feeling uh, the, the other sufferings, try to uh, mitigate it. Uh, one of the uh, Mukhtars, we, we, uh, the community leaders, uh, he said that uh, I helped uh, a person who is homeless and we um, we collected some uh, funds for him to uh, to build uh, two rooms and kitchen for them uh, and his life started to be uh, easier and he became more engaged with uh, with his neighbors and uh, one of women uh, who was uh, with with the committee uh, she said uh, well uh, previously when we meet this person we feel afraid because he, he used to be angry and uh, we are afraid of uh, being attacked by him uh, or uh, that he may be more uh, extremist. Uh, and interestingly, when the, that committee member provided help for him, uh, he, his attitude had been changed, he became more kind and uh, he was helpful uh, for them. So in general, uh, the trauma sensitive uh, approach helped in a better understanding to the cases uh, better understanding to ourselves, even for me as a doctor, uh, I started to understand well why people have that concerns uh, about their health status, the, the, their family members, and why they may get angry when they don't receive adequate services uh, and may even attack doctors, you know. Uh, and that made me more capable of uh, listening to people, uh, sympathizing with them providing better help uh, and even it helped me uh, in the training uh, workshops. Uh, I became more patient, um, uh, prefer to listen more to people and uh, uh, it gave me a, a very deep view that why such participants uh, may, may be not engaged in the training while others are very uh, interactive. So uh, I think the trauma approach uh, is very suitable for uh, communities uh, which are severely traumatized. And we found that there is a, a very remarkable differences in the response of people uh, in different areas. For instance, people from Ninawa are more traumatized and their response to uh, the program trainings and even to their way in resolving cases is totally different from people from Ambar uh, which is relatively less traumatized. Uh, and the same thing when we, uh, and me and Humam, uh, trained people from Syria. Uh, in fact, they are even more traumatized. Uh, and uh, the, the interesting thing that the more 
people are traumatized, the more they are engaged in the training, the, the more they, they want to know more and uh, they, they need to learn uh, skills uh, to, uh, to adapt with this uh, very uh, threatening situation. Um, that's why I think the, the trauma-informed approach is really important for such communities. Thank you, Dave. That, that local perspective and, and the stories are, are powerful. Um, so before we move on to the how, I just I know we've, we've covered a lot of the why, but I wanted to give all the panelists a chance just to, to maybe round any any things out or, or if we, we missed anything that's really important. Um, you know, I'll, I'll cede the floor to you uh, and then and then we'll move to the how this is done. And anything from anyone? No. OK, well, then let's move to the how. Uh, and so, I mean, I, I think that the case has been really strong for the why, uh, even in this short period of time. Um, but uh, the how becomes incredibly important and also needs to be localized, of course. Um, so let's start with Humam again uh, and, then, and then open it up to, to the rest of the team. Um, how did you integrate the approach technically uh, of, of a trauma-informed um, uh, programming, uh, and what lessons learned or best practices did you gain through applying that trauma-informed approach? And this is both for what you've been doing in, in Iraq, and of course also this, this approach has, has moved now to two municipalities in Syria and, and are also having you know, really strong results there. Yes, uh, uh, absolutely. On, I mean, on the how, I feel like, you know, the first the first trigger of uh, of the successfulness of this programming start when we and we learned the hard way to be honest we did uh, a training for the for the newly established committees and uh, we used the translators uh, to help uh, michelle deliver the trainings and th there were um, a huge disconnect because many things were lost in translation many of the uh, many of the uh, huge perceptions and uh, statements that Michelle was making to help people realize where they are and how they should uh, um, integrate or, or, or uh, you know, build on these, uh, uh, somehow on these challenges or build on some of the successes that they were able to do on their own uh, and deal with the trauma to interrupt the cycle of violence and making sure that they are not creating more cycles of harm uh, honestly, they were they they, they they did not get as uh, as powerful as they should be. Therefore, we decide to uh, shift the uh, the approach completely into more of a TOT. Me uh, and Raith uh, were uh, the trainees under uh, under Michelle's guidance, and uh, she honestly uh, not just gave us the material, but she allowed us to uh, uh, to hyper localize it. In, in a way that make it fully Iraqi, and I think even for the uh, for the Syria uh, training, we tried our best uh, uh, to to hyper localize it as well, to make sure it uh, it addresses the problem as is, to talk about the issues with sometimes even with the with the with the local dialect rather than uh, rather than uh, using using classic Arabic or mm -hmm. the literature translation of things that make people lost but actually the, the, the actual things. And uh, what we did as well, because me and uh, Andreith were get, getting into a, um, uh, into basically a, a mind planet with this, we had Michelle help us monitor our trainings. And we have an incredible translation to translate only for Michelle this time to tell her how we are doing as we move, uh, as we move forward. What kind of responses we get to every hyperlocal? What should we change? And we've met every day, uh, every time after the uh, after the trainings, to, uh, you know, to, for uh, some of the corrective actions, or to adopt uh, based on the reactions we we start to get. I think the fundamentals on the how is creating safe space, and it should start at the training venue itself. If we are as trainees, uh, trainers, unable to create this safe space for the participants, then we should not expect that those participants will be able to create safe space for their beneficiaries. So we did our best, me and Ray, and with the help of Michelle, to create the safe space. And by the way, this comes at a cost. This comes at uh, uh, me and Ray hearing all the traumas of the people. Uh, I mean, we hear 
you uh, for um, uh, for anyone who knows the, the local context a sheikh when he uh, especially if he is like you know at the decision making level uh, and uh, he announces publicly that he was powerful and was unable to do anything with ISIS presence mm -hmm. when they cut his traditional costumes uh, in front of his people and followers and he did not do anything Th this is uh, uh, this is a huge uh, indicator that we have created the safe space for people to open up we me and Raith, uh, we were uh, sometimes specifically with with uh, to take gender into perspective w uh, women uh, and female participants uh, in, in in these trainings they took sometimes Raith or myself aside and sometimes they even took michelle with the help of the translation translator to tell her like you know what what trauma that ha that i they they uh, they have been through and we used all these as uh, we build uh, first we once we know we get the trust then we make sure that nothing happened in the training session that disrupt this uh, safe space and i remember very well when we what we do because we've created uh, our community outlets uh, in uh, locations at different stages of the project we made sure that we uh, bring one or two uh, from the leaders from other communities who were successful to share their experiences lessons learned best practices to the new uh, uh, to the new uh, created committees and some of them when they hear these powerful the new committees when they hear some, because as Raith mentioned these locations although they are sometimes few miles away but the norms and the traditions some, or at least their responses to trauma is um, is a hugely different uh, so i remember one specific case where one of the sheikhs when he saw this sheikh is opening up and saying how he was you know he was he thought of himself as a less of a sheikh when he was unable to uh, defend his people and defend himself he was saying that this is not acceptable you are a sheikh you should stand uh, for your people and stand for yourself if you do this, then all the community will uh, will be uh, uh, defeated because their leader has been defeated in, in, in a single incident. Then with we, I remember me and Raith, we spent an hour trying to show all the aspects of this specific incident. While at the end, and non-intentionally, the guy who, who had uh, the, the, the other sheikh from the other neighborhood, who said that? Uh, who said this in the beginning? He said, "You know what? We were lucky. We had we did not get through these scenarios in our locations. We are really with you, and we hope and we appreciate you are here and telling us that the extremists, once they get powerful, this is what they will do to us and to our community." So it turned from um, criticizing the action of the leadership in this location into more of a collaborative approach and a lessons learned for them that they should fight at first and don't allow uh, those extremists to take over and then do these things and then they don't have the ability and the capability to respond uh, to respond in, in the way they would they would like and even the trauma informed approach they when when we start discussing the responses to the different incidents they start to see that well if you freeze this does not mean that you are not you don't have courage if you decide to fight back this does not mean that you are the most courageous person in in the community or if if you even if, uh, run away this could be uh, uh, you know the best approach because this is something that many people don't control actually all people don't control and it comes from specific functions of the brain that Raith and Michelle really and deliberately transfer to the to the to the community that these should not be your indicators of a person being courageous of or a person have, have been like you know had been covered or decide to withdraw from facing uh, facing the enemy or facing his fears so we we start building on this and uh, i i don't i want to jump into the, the, the uh, into something that we start uh, facing as we implement the project again and again and actually this was first an eye opener and second uh it tell us that we are on the right track i remember very well uh, we asked uh, our community outlets uh, through the uh, uh, lifetime of the project to adopt only cases that have some 
relation uh, to ISIS uh, because of ISIS leftovers, uh, because of ISIS tactics, because of ISIS traditions and uh, uh, approaches during their captivation. And I remember one case uh, that was a trigger for me and Raith to say, you know what? <laughs> Let's don't make, uh, you know, a first judgment. Let's wait for people to express why did they pick this case before we decide, well, this, this is uh, irrelevant to our work. So there was a case of a, a harassment in the street, specifically in, in Ramadi. Ramadi is part of the Ambar province, mostly uh, 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 tribal structure. And it has um, faced a huge uh, displacement uh, 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 during uh, 2014. And there were many uh, uh, tragedies happening in, on their uh, uh, displacement. And, uh, um, um, you know, for people who follow Iraq, they know there were many displacement camps in, uh, in Ambar that even with the, the government effort to, clo to close them, many of them stayed as, uh, as is but they are on without government now uh, support. So uh, the, what, what happened in this case, uh, there was a harassment in the main street by a couple of uh, young people uh, to a woman in the, sitting in a car in the middle of the, uh, of the market. Her husband was going to the grocery store. And when she got scared uh, of them and she wanted to open the door to go next to her husband, they thought that she's going to call her husband and something going to get big. So they start pushing back uh, the, the the door until they heard the woman and she starts screaming and then the people get together and they thought this is, they said that this is definitely uh, on the uh, on the cases that are that are related to ISIS and we said no this is uh, this has nothing to do it's just some, like you know some sort of an incident that happened in the street and then the sheikh of uh, uh, the, uh, and basically is the chairman of the committee in Ramadi who is honestly one of the one of the great examples for people and for even for the new uh, committee members this guy lost three of his kids to isis were killed during isis captivation and he is one of the uh, uh, maybe the most person who helped the return and integration of families with isis ties back into his community he said no you're taking this mistakenly there is th these kind of incidents will never happen in ambar especially in a tribal structure, because the consequences on them could go all the way to the head of the tribes. So people will never do it. The reason these things happened, those three young people, they were displaced into another area. And then they came back and they came back bringing traditions, norms from the new location, which is rapturing the, norm, the, the usual, the traditions and the norms we have in our community which we want to keep because they think they only serve for the greater good. This is why we think we should intervene. And we take the trauma approach into this to see where those people came from and to react to a way because there is honor also uh, uh, involved in it and to make sure that these uh, these kind of cases don't, uh, 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 basically the primary and secondary actors don't overreact to make these problems even bigger. And we said, well, I mean, if you, uh, you, you made your case and we're going to accept that uh, one, uh, this is as one of the cases that uh, we uh, uh, cover on this project. So uh, uh, basically what, what, what I'm trying to say is that once you feed this trauma-informed approach to the community, they will be the light to tell you what's the best way moving forward with their knowledge of, the, of, the, of their um, local norms and local traditions. And with their understanding of the trauma lens, they would even suggest better solution and be better forecasters that on, on conflict uh, don't, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, ho hopefully unfold in a bad way. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Imam. And, you know, there are a lot of questions coming in right now from, from the participants, and, and they're really looking at the still the, the how uh, and, and the what. Um, and so one of the things I don't think that we've necessarily covered yet is what the actual project looks like. So may maybe, Gaith, uh, you could just provide a very quick thing of like, here's the process that we're going through. Who is being trained? What are they being trained on? Uh, and what is the, the purpose of, of these committees? And then Michelle, Robbie, maybe you all can then really dig into what do the trainings involve? Like what's what's actually the gritty part of the trainings 
like what's the methodology of the trainings uh, that in order that, that help create the, the mind shift uh, among these committees? Um, Gase, why don't, why don't you go first? Okay. Uh, thank you, Camero. In fact, our program is composed of four main components. The first one is the uh, committees, the crisis committees. Uh, in each location, we have one crisis committee composed of seven to ten people uh, from diverse backgrounds, shares, women, activists, civil society organizations, and academics. Uh, the second component is uh, we have periodic surveys uh, every six months uh, for uh, looking for the drivers of violence, uh, about the um, uh, people uh, approach to solving their problems and uh, what are their opinions uh, toward the appraisal. The third uh, component is the media campaign, which is uh, mainly a Facebook page that we share on it uh, the infographics, uh, short films, uh, and uh, cartoons uh, giving positive uh, messages about the importance of peace and how to try to mitigate violence in Iraq. The fourth component, which is the, the most new one, is the initiatives to enhance social cohesion in all these locations. So uh, starting with the uh, committees, uh, we have series of trainings uh, for the committee members, uh, those diverse groups. Uh, we took uh, a TOT from uh, Michel uh, about the uh, trauma-informed approach and uh, about uh, peace building, social cohesion, using a trauma perspective. Then uh, I uh, discussed it with uh, Humam, and uh, we tried to make it more uh, Iraqi <laughs> within the, the context, uh, trying to uh, decrease the, the technical terms uh, and focus more on examples, on stories that we can rely on uh, and use uh, exercises group work that is convenient for participants and uh, fits within their context and background and fortunately uh, they liked it so much uh, so we delivered these trainings uh, uh, focusing on main uh, skills of uh, mediation uh, and uh, about uh, negotiation skills and then using the uh, trauma lens to look and analyze the cases uh, and find more innovative solutions for it uh, using this approach. And the second training was about the um, social cohesion and how we can use the um, trauma lens to find better solutions for some problems that affect the population in these target locations. Uh, for instance, that uh, some regulations in, in these locations uh, may affect people's um, uh, transportation or their daily life and how we can use uh, this uh, reassuring approach for people and even for governmental parties to be more engaged and more uh, adaptive for these uh, real uh, changes and uh, obstacles. Uh, then we, we used to follow these committees uh, through uh, monthly meetings uh, held by our local partners and monitored by our uh, team. Uh, also, we reviewed all the material we used, whether the uh, templates, the questions of the qu uh, interviews, the questionnaires, uh, even the media contents. We reviewed it again with the help of Michelle uh, from the uh, trauma point of view, uh, trying to be very careful not to create new trauma for people when we address their uh, cases uh, and we had many uh, examples where people um, they, they talked about an initiative uh, in Diala uh, there were some terrorist attacks to people um, from the, uh, the let's say forest or uh, some lands uh, with the palm trees uh, so the local uh, security forces uh, with had agreement with the people, uh, the owners of these lands, that they will cut these trees and try to make it more, um, uh, it will cannot be used as nests for, for the terrorists. Um, once they said this, we started to discuss, well, is this solution will create another trauma? Because those trees had, people have memories. They are proud of their uh, uh, lands. Uh, their palms, uh, the palms uh, mean a lot for Iraqi people. 
including my father also. <laughs> so when when people, when the security forces cut their trees, uh, after a while, people started to demonstrate, asking for compensations or refusing the solution. So we told the uh, participants that this solution has created another trauma for people. So we have to avoid it. And fortunately, the uh, participants started to suggest more innovative initiatives, uh, more adaptive to the local context. Uh, also, uh, the project include um, uh, some strategic sessions uh, when we meet those uh, uh, committees uh, and try to discuss the success stories, lessons learned, and uh, all other uh, activities of the program. Fortunately, people used to uh, confirm that this approach is very helpful in sol solving cases. And it helped them also to understand themselves as, as committee members and manage the committees in a better way, uh, in, in more cooperative way. Um, finally, uh, we would like to say that uh, we think that all the training material and the, the products of the program became more trauma sensitive and it, it became more adaptive and more within the, the context of these locations. Uh, and our advice that uh, if we would like to succeed with this approach, we need to make it more local. We need to rely on the context. Uh, we may, sometimes, and we have many conflicts I, uh, with, with Humam, that uh, can we use the terminology of conflict and, you know, uh, very complicated neurological terms or psychological terms uh, to those people. And then we found a solution that it is not necessary to tell them that this approach is named, uh, let's say, sympathy, or this is a sympathetic approach in resolving cases. Just let them know that in order to solve the case, you have to feel the beneficiaries' emotions. Mm -hmm. Try to share uh, with them your, your feelings, listen more, and to be more engaged and more helpful. Uh, provide safe space for them through active listening through uh, trying to help them, giving them examples, creating positive deviances. Uh, so uh, the, the committees were so glad with this approach. And uh, we think that, and we are thinking about developing it even more to uh, try to have a manual uh, or um, uh, a way of training that can be used by the committee members to train others or help others through providing advice. Thank you so much, Reis. That was a really um, helpful overview um, of, of DTI's project. I'm going to zoom out uh, a bit because there are several questions more about specifically the how. And there are lots of really important questions people are asking. How are you doing this when the situation is still unstable? How are you doing this when there is still a traumagenic environment? and, and these are important points because in protracted conflict situations, we don't have pure stability. And even when there is stability, it's there is anticipation of instability or anticipatory stress. And um, there are also uh, one thing that I also want to say that someone else has brought up as well is that there are so many other factors in the environment that are impacting trauma, policy, regulations, um, the level of basic services, all of these things exactly are increasing the stress load on people. And, and so when we're talking about what are we, what are we trying to achieve at sort of the most basic level and meeting people where they are is relative safety. Um, or I look at it, I call it as, as, as social safety and helping people to be able to um, increase their ability to um, know uh, how they're feeling, what they're feeling, why they're feeling, and how they can respond to it and to try and build some perspective and, and context around it. So for, for the DTI project, and I also implemented two stabilization projects specifically 
in um, Mosul itself. Um, it, it really started, and I think with DTI too, through the committees of providing a deeper understanding of trauma and how it is impacting uh, people individually, but also on a collective level around the social dynamics. So I developed a specific curriculum around trauma-informed social change, which pulls from the six principles of, um, of, of trauma-informed work. It, it pulls from relational approaches. It, it pulls from social behavioral approaches with um, Harvard University, Eastern Mennonite University, and helping people to understand trauma at a, at a deeper level. And, and when you look at localization of this language, as both Wraith and Humam said, is really, really important because from a Western perspective, how we talk about these things um, does not translate into how people experience them or how people understand them or talk about them. And so one of the things that we did on my projects with local change agents was we actually developed together, how would this be discussed? How would these concepts um, and these topics and these issues be discussed, not just in an Iraqi, in an Iraqi context, but in a Mosul context using Maslawi dialect mm -hmm. um, with different groups who we were trying to help increase the sense of social safety around. And, also looking at the context and how they saw that trauma might be impacting social dynamics. And after that, what we did, uh, similar to what the committees are doing now, is we these, these change agents, they actually developed um, under a small grants program, uh, specific um, trauma-informed interventions to help increase a sense of social safety for different vulnerable groups. And that looked different for each group and depending on the change agents and what they were bringing. And it wasn't just, it wasn't workshops. It was activities that specifically mitigated um, sense of uh, different indicators that we were looking at. So whether it was um, helping to build social connection, helping to build um, uh, social engagement agency, um, also emotional regulation, stress reduction techniques. So we used a lot of embodied techniques as well um, that we were very careful to make sure that they were also culturally appropriate and gender sensitive. And, and through those activities, and I should mention, sorry, just to back up, that the, the selection of change agents, similar to the selection of DTI, was very diverse because we wanted to reach different groups of people using different methodologies. So we had medical students, we had musicians, we had NGO leaders, we worked with social workers, um, we worked with artists, musicians, uh, people in sports. And so there was a very intentional integration of this trauma-sensitive lens, very much um, working with the local population to help mitigate um, the, the psychosocial impacts of trauma, but things that were also um, exacerbating trauma um, to help build that sort of internal resourcing capacity to be able to gain greater, um, greater understanding um, and, and management over um, how they were feeling, how they were reacting, and how they were responding. Um, and you can do that indirectly as well um, through things like social connection, um, through creating uh, safe spaces, through creating trust and transparency, collaboration and mutuality, through understanding cultural and historical context. and. And I just want to say that when we talk about localization um, and meeting people where they are, so we talk about you know creating a safe space, uh, 
the, the question then, or, or any of the, the six trauma-informed principles, and it's, it's not what I think about them or how I think they should be created, right? It's, it's constantly going back to the people who are participating and asking them, what does safety look like to you in this mm-hmm. context, right? Because these are fluid contexts, as everyone has said, right? And mm-hmm. so what does safety look like for you? What does trust and transparency look like for you? What does collaboration look like for you? And when we're asking, right? So when we're asking from that side, what are we doing? We're also empowering people, Mm -hmm. right? To, To begin to think through what these things might look like, feel like for them. Mm. Rather than us opposing, imposing some sort of assumption about how we think this should look, what success looks like, how we think the process should go, right? So when we're actively really in this organic iterative process saying, okay, what what are the indicators for success or how would you perceive success in a certain way or how would this impact you positively? We're already starting down this road of empowerment um, and agency and, 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 and I think that's really an important point because so many times we go to a project and we already have the indicators worked out. We already have the strategy worked out, the objectives. And yet we don't know if that's aligning with where they are in their, in their, in their sense of, of, of self, their sense of agency, well-being, connection. And these are really deep, these are really quite deep concepts when you really get into things like social connection and what that means in an unstable environment and how people achieve that. Um, And so I'm not sure if that has helped. Have you found useful ways to measure the effectiveness of this trauma-informed approach? Um, and, And I'll just say this quickly because I see Robbie wants to jump in. Yes and no. There is still a lot of work that needs to be done from the m and perspective, mm-hmm. I think, writ large with donors, right, to say, what does, what does agency look like and how do we measure it? Agency is so often looked at as skills or capacity, but when we're talking like from agency for people who are living through traumagenic experiences, Uh, generation after generation, agency might look like um, having hope, having self-determination, having confidence. Um, And so I think, you know, working more deeply, having more bridging empathy, right? Mm -hmm. These are all really important indicators from a trauma-informed approach that do directly translate into the uh, agency that do directly translate into being able to build social cohesion, right? But are often seen as too touchy-feely within the development Mm -hmm. community. Hope is a huge, huge indicator. It's also very protective against trauma. And to get even to hope, you need to do so much to build to get people even to hope. But we don't often think that hope is a is a valid indicator to be measuring around uh, people's ability to create social change. But without hope and the ability to see a different future, mm. right? What are we saying about our ability to achieve social change? Robbie. Oops, yeah. Oh, so if I could just say as well, I mean, some of the other specific things that we're looking at, particularly in the stabilization field, is sort of the bridging empathy, empowerment, and agency, perception, and narrative change, particularly of self and other, um, trauma, stress, resilience, and emotional regulation, hope, purpose, and meaning, social connection and belonging, personal and social responsibility and accountability. These are the, the different components that Mm -hmm. we worked quite a bit on, uh, particularly with these two trauma-informed stabilization projects in Mosul. And building on that just a little bit, and I I will try to keep it brief, Cameron, for final roundup, but um, 
in looking at those things, one thing that often we found, at least I found in my projects and programs, is that you don't know what you're looking for until midway through the project because then you see it and you see it's changed, but you didn't measure it at the beginning to get a baseline. So as more and more of these projects are being done, I think to Michelle's point, you start to develop sort of indicators that you can look for. But the other issue with um, within the donor community as well, um, and for us as practitioners or donors, is that often we measure success by what a group or a community is doing writ large. And we negate the impact of individuals, well-trained, capable individuals. So for instance, I know Michelle and some of her projects and Gaith and um, Humam have given examples of individuals and theirs. They've gone on to impact multiple, multiple, multiple members of communities because they are aware of their own trauma, because they've been given tools on how to address that, but there's no way to measure that. And so I think that inherent is an issue. Um, some of the best practices and lessons learned for communications um, approach with this is one is don't discount your communications as mere PR. You can use, if you craft it well, you can use your communications to add a bit of boost to your programming, your trauma-informed programming to spread the message. And I think that's one thing that I really take away from this is that in these contexts, we have access to so many tools. Sometimes it's digital media, sometimes it's traditional, sometimes it's word of mouth, but every action is a communication piece. Everything that happens on the ground to Yates story previously about someone behaving differently, people around in these communities, they see it and that's communicated to other people. And so thinking about your projects and programs more holistically and looking at them and saying, okay, how do I design a communications approach around this where I'm not just doing PR for my activities? And what does that look like? Because what you can do with that and what we were able to do in Iraq was to build a space where you could have people that had participated in your activities that were interested in the type of program and not just trauma-informed programming, but where they could come and talk because part of when you dig down into trauma is this issue of otherness and otherness gets around what people perceive is permissible within their group and what's not permissible in their group. But if you can expand the boundaries of permissibility, you will see behavior change. But that comes about through people seeing other people behaving in certain ways and certain norms. Um, and finally, just a reminder, and I think this came up in some questions about, you know, are the people in the trainings traumatized? In these environments, your, your local staff is going to be traumatized. People reading your content are going to be traumatized. Every You're traumatized. And so it's really important to get in touch and to know that we have, as a matter of course, provided trauma training for the majority of our staff and have found that once they understand something simple as the way I'm feeling is a normal reaction to an abnormal situation, they actually begin to engage in a completely different way. And they design activities and create content from a different perspective. So the training of the staff, um, incorporating activities and messaging, and also considering the individual, not just the group and what we're doing and in our strategies and plans, because groups are made of individuals. And it's going back to institutions and something Michelle said that institutions can harm people, but they very rarely heal people, but people can help other people heal. And so when we both start counting the effects on the individual as important, then, then we begin to see a different type of effect. Um, yeah, and I, I think that's all. I don't know, that's, that's a lot. Uh, so, so we have just, just a few minutes left. Um, so I'm hoping we can go uh, around the horn, and I and I apologize that we didn't get to all the questions um, in the chat. You, you see that there's will be made available. Um, also, feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, you know, all of us have our, our um, email addresses on our individual websites um, to to continue the conversation. Also, to answer the question, uh, we don't have anything published on this yet. Uh, we will be publishing uh, on this uh, in the first half of 2022. Uh, we're working on that right now uh, for what we can share and can't share. Um, one of the, the core values of DT Institute, though, is radical transparency. Um, and so uh, if we are finding something that's working well, we want the entire community to know about it. 
um, you know, the rising tides, you know, right, right, raise all ships or whatever the saying is. Um, so let's quickly go around uh, to each of you. We'll start with Gaith, then Humam, uh, Michelle, and we'll finish with Robbie. Uh, if you could name one key takeaway for either donors or practitioners uh, who are considering using a trauma-informed approach, what would that one key takeaway be? And each of you have one minute to do this, and I'm going to hold you to it, Humam. Who should, start, should I start first or Gaith? Uh, Gaith can start first, but I'm going to hold you to one minute is what I'm saying. I, I can live with that. Okay. Uh, I think uh, the most important point is uh, the more you are considering the local context, context the more you will be successful in uh, implementing trauma-informed approach. Another thing to say that the change in, in such projects is felt rather than measured. And in order to, to have real monitoring and evaluation for this, maybe we need to have a new or uh, to review mm -hmm. our monitoring and evaluation tools. And also it should be more trauma sensitive tools. Thank you. Uh. Can I take what Ray left? It's uh, he did it in less than a minute. <laughs> so uh, I mean, one I would say. Uh, so we again, I would reiterate what I've said in the beginning. We were privileged with our donor to give us multi years, and I agree with Robbie hundred percent. We found things across the way, and then we've changed the way we measure things as we move forward. We looked at the successes, let's say, of our trauma informed approach by looking by analyzing each case that has been resolved after we introduce the trauma training and ask people specifically if they adopt different ways or different uh, approaches learning from the uh, uh, learning from the trauma tools and uh, looking at uh, uh, how to interrupt cycles of violence and making sure of not creating uh, other cycles of harm so i i would say my only my my one takeaway for any donor is to give more uh, life span for trauma informed projects to allow us to see results, adjust as we move forward. And hopefully, uh, uh, you know, we could create a whole um, manual for, for, for future programming based on lessons learned and best practices from us implementing. And I think this is what we will be doing for the, uh, for the two projects we're currently running in, actually three projects now, uh, two in Syria and one in Iraq. Thank you. Michelle, you're next. This is, uh, there are so many, so many points, but I just want to say this is not something separate. You know, it, this is about, again, looking whole of human and it's, it's, it is so it's not like you do the trauma informed part and then you do the stabilization part and then you do the media part right this is complete integration and it's meant to be supportive of achieving other development goals other stabilization goals it is it is meant to be an an internal transformation that then radiates out and impacts um, the community and those relational spaces and and so I think there is a donors have this impression that it's either separate or it slows down or delays the ability of a project to move forward and yet and achieve results. And yet you are achieving results throughout the whole process, right? Because it is an integrated process. And I, I would also say it is not just a project process, right? When you're when you are integrating trauma informed approaches, you're integrating it into your management. You're integrating it into um, ideally how you're showing up and how you are managing these projects and how you're interacting with your staff. And, and I think that's a, a really critical point because it's not something out there. It's something in here and it's inside all of us in terms of, of how we understand and relate to each other. Um, and so you know, when we think it's something out there, we're continuing to just perpetuate the other, like this idea of the other. 
and and it, and it furthers this detachment where what we're trying to look for is is greater communion and relationship um and so i i guess i will just leave it leave it at that oh and, and one point on the time frame as well humam is right they've had the the privilege of time but i would like to say that oftentimes donors give you one or two years and then they extend it a year and then a year and then a year and it would be so much uh more effective if donors once they felt that the approach was worthwhile after a pilot gave a longer period of time because when you always think you're closing down for a year like a year later you're going to close a year later you're going to close it impacts your ability to build and and create strategy for the long term um so i i'll leave it at that and i'll just say in order one takeaway in order to meet people where they are the best advice I can say is to make the assumption that everyone, even yourself, even the donors, are doing the best you can with the information and context you have every day. And if you believe that and you look into that, then you'll better understand why and how the situation and the context is what it is, both with the policymakers and with people in the field in the field and with yourself and then you can design programs around that that are local that are dynamic that are responsive and pay attention every day every week because it changes and the situation changes and being willing and able to pivot and have the ability to go back to the donors and talk to them about it in their language because you're making the assumption that they're doing the best they can as well is really helpful Thanks, Robbie. And, and thanks to everyone uh, who's joined us. Thank you to Alliance for Peacebuilding for providing the space for peacebuilders to get together and share you know, our hard-won knowledge. And thanks to Robbie, Gaith, Michelle, and Humam uh, for sharing your knowledge today. Um, again, reach out to any of us uh, if you have questions. Uh, and thanks for spending this last 90 minutes with us. Enjoy the rest of your days. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.